Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Bar Academy. We are here with Napoleon Blown Apart, who submitted a ticket recently, and a lot of other players. Shout out Nutty Wombat, fellow mentor who's also here. So yeah, here we are on Greenhaven. Uh, Napoleon, can you introduce this game and tell us why you submitted the ticket? Sure. Okay, so I got to preface with a couple things. Uh, for some reason, I've submitted this to the to the, the bar devs. When you watch me play and you watch replays of mine, the camera is skewed by like 15 degrees. I promise you I'm looking at it straight. It's the most annoying thing. I don't know why it happened. Oh, for real? So don't worry about how the camera looks a little funky. So you don't look like this? No, definitely not. It okay. looks very vertical. It's way top <laughs> down, so that's not right, necessarily okay, what's okay. going on. Um, and then I'm not looking so much for the early game. I know you guys focus a lot on the openings. I'm more looking at like maybe four to five minutes plus. Um, I happen to have looked at this replay already, and I do know I didn't get down some nanos quickly enough. I would have liked to get them maybe five minutes, and I delayed that till I don't know, seven or eight minutes. And right. then my start is a little funny. I've played a number of games with this guy, so I was more or less uh, picking a different spawn than I would normally. Uh, nor I would go a little closer to the middle and take a three max, but I took one of the three maxes in the corner instead. So that maybe is a little bit of a different choice, uh, but there was a reason for that too. So, uh, but mainly like mid game stuff is what I'm really curious about. Um, kind of like more right. of the tempo y things in the game, yeah. how I can generate yeah. more tempo, uh, those kinds of things. Okay, that's that's good to know. Um, for those of you who are in the Academy chat, I, I did have to restart my screen share. So, um, can you let me know if that's uh, picking up the, the game for you guys? It is. Yep, okay. you're good now. All right. It's all right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so, of course, as we're watching this together, guys, if you have questions or want to interject, interject, feel free to do that. Right. So, um, yeah, let's uh, let's look at this. I can't help myself. I, I'll try and look at your open because I do think that, like, as far as like tempo goes and on that side of things, I definitely think the the early game can can feed into what your you know what your game state looks like. You know seven minutes into the game, five minutes into the game. Um, also notice you're against Blue Gecko, who's pretty strong, actually, and it's cool to see that he's over 41 OS. So um, this is Greenhaven. Well, um, a lot of players a lot of players from the BPL didn't seem to really care for this map, but for those of you who haven't played on it, there's like a decent amount of metal reclaim, 640, and a lot of energy on a low wind speed map. So it's 10 wind speed, and... The metal is kind of concentrated around these geos. Like that's a little pack of a hundred metal there. This is a pack of a hundred metal, right? And uh, so on and so forth. Eight is a low wind speed. Sorry, what's that? Well, eight is a low wind speed. Yes, I would characterize this as a, a low and even a higher wind risk. So like um, the minimum is five to 10 with a wind risk of 20 and the average is eight. Yeah, so that's, that's fairly low and like I think on paper it's uh, still better to do wins than solars, uh, but I think in practice it plays a little more like a solar map. So um, take that for what it's worth. Uh, just just kind of my two cents. So uh, both are both are perfectly viable. So it looks like we've gone for wind turbines actually, which is kind of it's pretty much okay. Like even if like wind's dropping here. This is a bit of a blunder. Wait, I have a question. Is it good? If you replace them with solars, do you use the same amount? Um, not really, no. Because it's more of a function, of, I think, of your build power. Hmm, how do I say this? Like, like uh, they're obviously, solars are more metal expensive, so you kind of have to be a little more careful and diligent about how you're adding them on, on them pair, compared to, like, scaling energy via wind i think a lot of times you can just use like your fourth con out of the factory to scale a, a little bit of like a box of wind right underneath of a con turret hopefully right so put a con turret there and then have like a little wind farm right so that's kind of all you need in 1v1s at this like in the early mid game so but yeah to answer your question hopefully i did um Back to this open, I think it, it might actually be a little bit of a blunder here to trying to get this factory up. We see, I think, yeah, I see you actually stall on the uh, metal, or excuse me, energy. So you're forced to make a solar right there. I think that could have been alleviated if you went maybe like fourth and or even fifth wind before your 
factory, right? So just my two cents on that. I know you didn't really want to hear too much about it. <laughs> grave robber, two grunts. I love the grave robber. I'll put this on 2x for now. Quick question. Yeah. The trees on this map haven't been nerfed, right? I believe it is. So you only get the 30, 30 E per tick. Let's double check that. Mm. Yeah, that's that's the these are the nerf oh, yeah. trees, right, right? Would you still do Resbot first if you do solar? Yeah, and the nice thing about doing solar is you say you went like two max two solars, Resbot first, you can assist it out a little bit quicker than off of a win start. Because uh you'll have a little more E when the factory finishes. Yeah, you just have the consistent E run. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not like a super big deal. It's it's just kind of I'd I'd call it a slight advantage doing that. Um, of course, you end up paying for it because it costs more metal to do the solar starts. And this metal I would characterize as also like it's it sucks because it's low wind and it, in some ways it's like low metal. Like they're spread apart, right? And it can be hard to uh, expand and defend them, right? So kind of makes it like feel maybe like a, a lower metal map than it might actually is, right? Um, Napoleon kind of like to kind of touch on something maybe we'll get into later on is these are the 2.3 mexes right so there's two there there's two here you spawned on the three right and that's mirrored on the other side of the map of course but some other positions to note I think are these three mech spots on the top and bottom are points you might want to contend contest and then here in the middle of the map there's like a really high density of mexes as well so when i'm looking at this map i'm thinking hey can i grab these mexes as quickly as possible and then can i maybe secure this side while denying this and then of course contesting contesting mid right so that's that's like basically how the game plays out i end up taking the mexes on the bottom here and the top uh he ended up going towards the middle first so he actually ends up getting the middle of the game and then or in the middle, I take all of that back. I do end up winning this game. Um, it's kind of a long drawn oh, game. Wah, I don't want to watch wah, the whole thing. Wah. Please submit your know. losses. I don't want to look at the games you win. Um, no, that's that's fine. Um, nothing wrong with looking at the game. I was happy. I beat somebody a little bit better than me, yeah. so it was a good one to replay because right. how do you know how do you do that even better, I guess. Right, right. Question. Uh, let me pause here and just kind of take note. This is, I think we're entering the mid game ish, early mid game. So, what, you have two cons expanding. Is that an LLT? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I don't see any radars up just yet. Is there, there is one in your main. I in would... about five seconds, that con on the north is going to end up dropping a radar. Like yeah. right here? Uh, no, the one above it on the edge, actually. Okay, but okay. yeah, I'll, I'll drop one in a second. Yeah, these little like. I don't know what to call these. They're not plateaus, right? But they're kind of like little hills. Uh, make for decent radar spots. On it's hard. It's hard to get good radar coverage on this map, so uh, you kind of have to fight for these uh, good quality locations, right? Um, let me unpause this. Two cons expanding. I see we've gone for some energy converters here. I uh, don't really like that. Um, I think if you're, say, <clears throat> you're not really accessing right now, so I don't quite agree with this. If you had an energy storage and were accessing, I would say, yeah, make a, make the energy converters. But right now I see you still have a solar in your base. And I would like to point out that the difference in metal cost between an energy storage and a solar is about 25 metal. So in any period of time where you're considering making uh, energy or uh, energy converters and haven't made energy storage, reclaim your solar and try that. Right, but I even don't really like reclaiming solar on this map because it's such a low wind speed. Right, so you would want if you are scaling wind like this, maybe have like a few basic solars, or at least an energy storage. So kind of want to throw that out there. Let me pause here, take a look. Expanding there. <clears throat> Look at your player view. I still have a question about the opener. 
Yeah. A little bit. Was that uh, like two or three mechs uh, things, and then a few wind turbines, and then is solar collector or? Yeah. I mean, is that a solar energy or a, or an energy collector? Uh, those are synonyms, right? So this is a solar energy collector. I'm not. This right here is a basic solar, right? So I guess they go by many names, but um, they function the oh, same yeah. way, right? It's like 150 metal for plus 20 E per second, right? That's uh, it, it. It stores energy on the side. That's uh, that's probably what I didn't get. Oh, okay. So these are two different structures. I get. Is this your question? Like, there's a solar collector and then the energy storage. So like, I on, think so. Yeah. If you see here, I have, um, I'm like looking at the build grids for the commander, right? So if you're on grid, okay, it's, okay. it's X. Let me explain. That one's that one's a solar collector like uh, that you'll put instead of the windmill, right? Yeah, yeah. So is he using that for uh, energy collection? Uh, it looks like he's doing mostly winds. So I mean, when you... There's also a building called the energy collector. Uh... And... I want to I want to stop putting too many of the uh converters like you're talking about. I see. I don't see an energy so now, collector exactly. Up to now, well up to now you said uh you don't want to put energy converters without a collector. And I don't uh, see a collector. sorry, sorry. Um sorry for the misunderstanding. I said uh you don't want to be making energy converters without an energy storage first. Uh, we could add extra caveats onto that, but it's the, yeah, it's the energy storage up here. You would want to have that. So there's not one, and that actually is just a solar collector, not a convert, not a collector. Um, okay, so solar collector and <laughs> energy collector, solar panel. Those are that's one thing, and energy storage is another, and then an energy converter finally converts like. 20, 70 energy per second to one metal per second so those are oh, like you said you don't want to you don't want conversion without a collector because it'll be better for the excess than that uh you don't want converter. a converter Sorry, I mixed them up again. without a storage yeah, yeah. uh no, for sure for yeah. sure yeah uh i maybe you could add some like caveats onto that but generally speaking like you would want to like have all of these mixes taken and not stall not excess energy right so especially on like a low wind speed map like say say like you were only making it like basic solars like energy converters are just kind of terrible um so so after the with the three first of the uh com bots they go out and put uh all those metal ex metal collectors uh, these are metal extractors and these are uh construction bots or com yeah right? well i tried when i try and put my three com bots on the three independent metal collection spots i didn't know what to do with them so i just took all i just used the area expand on the whole map is that like i don't think that's what you're supposed to do not really um i think it's better to like say say you are expanding with like three cons right like kind of have like a path right so like one con might go like this way and expand right one con might go like this and expand and another con might go like something like this right and you just yeah. kind of like maybe like oh place a radar here right on this path might be place a radar here on this path or like an llt here you know that's helpful right right and the same goes for this path, right? We kind of talked about or touched on earlier, like putting up maybe like a, a radar here. Here's a good spot, right? So ideally you'd want to, um, I would, I would recommend is uh, expanding with just like radars and as few LLTs as you can kind of manage. If you're getting frustrated and like kind of losing expansions a lot to pressure or run buys or stuff like that, maybe try and add a few more LLTs, but I think that I think really the end game you would want is to just be kind of naked expanding, like no LLTs and then just radars. Like say this con would just be like max, 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 and then like a radar here, maybe an LLT. So like, they are just going to keep baking metal extractors. Yeah, essentially till all of them are taken. That's gonna that's kind of like what I'd characterize as like the early game, right? Is you're like splitting the map in half, or even just getting out your first initial expanding cons, 
and you feel like maybe entered the mid game perhaps like once players have moved on to tank production or like the map is split in half right most of the maxes are taken there's like llts everywhere and the map's kind of getting choked up right um, okay yeah so good questions um trying to think about uh one thing i'm noticing is just like your rally point maybe could be like a little farther out on the map right it's kind of large and it takes spots forever to move across so like yeah this might not be like the best position but you're still um thinking about like tempo side of things right it's like i see i see two 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 grunts over here like these five grunts are here and these ones are back here right if we had been spending more of the game like spreading out our grunts in these huge arcs right I, I like doing that on this map actually like these ones just spread them out because it is so hard to get vision right and um one th one one thing i was kind of one phrase i was taught by ragna was like when playing bots you kind of want to be like water in a sense is you're like looking for little holes in their defenses to try and sneak through right and if like you had grabbed these and maybe drawn an arc like this you'd have more opportunities to spot those kind of like little gaps in their play so um see now we're like you know, moving across with these maybe being a little indecisive that's not a big deal like it's good to protect these cons i like the lts and the radars so um you know slow is steady steady is fast as they say yeah going up to third con yeah so this is nice i like this uh, i think you might have blocked your commander in maybe <laughs> Khan is uh, the factory is idle, never good. He's worth his weight in build power. It's fine. He'll dig himself out eventually. Uh, yeah, right. Like, I did have a small <laughs> moment where it was idle. Yeah, I was looking at something. Yeah, it's it's fine. And this is where having a radar like really kind of helps you. Let's look at the player view for a second. Uh, even having your like the rally point here out, out farther, right? So the farther we get radar coverage, and the farther our rally point is, like I think the easier it is to have these units kind of spread out and defending against the thing your bot opponent is trying to do, which is be like water, right? And slip into slip into your back line, find damage and whatnot. Let me check the Discord real fast. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think Neb's going to be joining us tonight, but no big deal. Um, let's continue on. Exploiters are really good, but it happens. How long is this game, actually? Not too long, I imagine. Okay, so this is a big problem. All right, all right. Um, huge metal bar right now. <clears throat> this is, like, I think, um, the nice thing about having an early energy storage is you can start slapping down a con turrets when you need them efficiently. So I, in this position, I'm looking, like, say, if I was you, I would be thinking, oh, I have a full E-bar. I have 1,200 metal in the bank. I need to either be thinking about some kind of like second factory, even though my metal income might be a little under where I want it to be, or I really need to like get multiple con turrets up and even perhaps like scaling solars like with my commander. It's like we have to find a way to spend this metal, right? And um, of course, that's done through having additional build power right which is going to uh require more e so it's kind of a balancing act I'm, i know you know this napoleon but uh if i were to give you two cents i would this is nice energy excess is um under 10 percent, right so very good some benchmarks i like to do is like e storage around uh 300 metal per second right excuse me energy per second Second factory around like a couple hundred metal in the bank and 30 income per second. But on this map, it's it's a little bit different because uh, it is so hard to secure some kind of like steady metal income. So you just lost a little expansion and uh, already down to 23. How do you win this game? How does this man blunder at his position? I would say I think <laughs> you would actually be a little bit behind here if I was looking at this game state. Even on metal, even on uh, energy. Okay, so that in that regard, and this is actually a cool distinction, right? He's on he's on solar economy. You're on uh, wind.
Sorry, I thought I heard like a question there. Is that a sneeze? No, that was just me turning on my mic. It probably looks like a bad game state for him just because of how much metal is in the bank. Right, for sure. Definitely. Um, And even, I think I see, oh, are we moving our, we got to even move our commander's build power a bit to uh, defend against this raid. So I'm not sure if you uh, continue walking to those three mexes. Yeah. See, even like this right here is kind of like a blunder in some ways. It's like, well, this represents what, 300 of, I mean, this is another like, 400 right so like I, I know it's not quite 50 percent of our build power right but quite a bit of the build power is just kind of walking away from our lab or a way to assist additional contours up because we're still in this position like big e-bar um not big e-bar full energy bar and full metal bar which to me is like oh make basic solars right um because i need to spend the metal and increase my build power right which uh, these construction turrets draw quite a bit of energy. What is that? It's not telling me. Oh, it's pause. So it's not going to tell me what it's drawing. Like, yeah, to assist the lab, it's like minus 140. This is assisting a wind turbine. That's minus 30, right? And assisting another con turret is minus 120 per tick, right? So uh, we're stalling on energy, full metal bar. To me, that's make basic solars. Oh, look at that. We're doing that right now. So <laughs> good job. Um. Quick note, I think. Um, the big difference being wind and solar, I think, is the fact that Napoleon actually has a full metal bar and Gecko hasn't. Mm -hmm. Even though they are pretty much equal. Yeah, that's like Gecko has put the metal down, but that's because he has made solar. All right. All right. Also, too, he's like made exploiters everywhere as well, which are a bit more expensive than the basic in a metal extractor so it's like 50 metal compared to 240 and exploiters have the same dps as a single lt but they take the same amount of time to build so it's like 90 metal 700 energy for the basic llt and the exploiter is 240 metal right so like a, a basic That's solar a and, and a, like a card. Right, right right but they're build yeah. power efficient right so if you have the um notice he's not stalling on energy uh, if you, I mean, mm. if you have the metal to do them, I, I mean, they're great units, especially at this like skill level, maybe like 45 plus OS, 50 OS plus, you might get punished for trying to expand with exploiters. But I mean, at this, it's like, I don't, I don't mind it at all, especially like he's made them, you know, kind of far away from his base, not like super far, but I mean, the map is big. It's hard to get radars up and it's hard to like keep these mixes alive. So I don't really mind the uh, exploiters too much. Like this one's like holding it down, right? No run by for you. And it didn't cost anything. Yeah, I think actually the exploiters on multiple mech spots is, is actually good because one exploiter can defend multiple mechs. Right, right. Uh, the, the, cl the flip side to that is like, what is it to put? It's to put like 500 metal to put two exploiters down, whereas it's 100 to put two metal extractors down. So it's like, well, 400 metal is like, like 11 grunts something like that so just think 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 of it in terms like that and like back to like earlier where napoleon was talking about like mid-game things and tempo and whatnot uh, i think like build power rex and of course like how you balance metal is a huge part of like where tempo is at in a game state right so uh, maybe we'll get more into that later uh, looks like relatively even army values. Um, yeah, just like within one two percent of each other as well. So, I'm thinking Napoleon actually how he ends up winning this game is the fact he's got a full metal uh, full metal bar and has been more efficient like metal wise scaling his energy and this might actually start like showing um, showing itself right because now you're on three contours you can print like infinite grunts right now. Um, Whereas your opponent is like stalling on metal, um, doesn't have as much build power and is trying to go for these basic solars. Even like these uh, advanced energy, uh, advanced energy, what am I saying? Advanced solar collectors are super energy intensive and uh, can be, um, I, can, I don't know if it's like a way to throw the game in some ways, but I mean, they're super strong if you can get them up, especially like if like both players are kind of struggling for energy but they do have their costs right oh yeah okay. they're very expensive to put down for sure 
I've noticed that on like only solar maps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, now I'm seeing how how Napoleon gets back into this game and he's going to leverage that extra metal he has from using wind turbines to get the second vehicle lab, which incisors are kind of insane versus grunts. Um, like yeah, he's pretty yeah. efficient. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they're just like, once you get them uh, clumped up together, like even five, seven, seven incisors, it becomes very difficult to engage uh, with grunts. Um, like attacking into them, you're not going to trade efficiently. This is a nice little attack here. Sorry if I'm kind of zipping around with the camera. Can I see something? How much energy is getting converted to metal? How much energy is getting converted to metal? I see two energy converters in Napoleon's base, and I see zero in our man Gecko's. So they're pretty good. Uh, pretty good. Uh, I would say so. Uh, I don't think energy converters are uh, like the yeah, lower wind is. Don't like don't help me. I, whenever I use it, I uh, like they don't help me at all. Energy get converters. Metal. Yeah, I can't get metal fast enough. Um. But, uh, I'll just submit a replay if <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, um, you're more than welcome to just tag at mentor and uh, we can make a ticket for you. All right, Napoleon, uh, tell us your thought process here. Like, what are you thinking right now? <clears throat> Looking at this, say, from your perspective. Okay. Um, so in general, I've at this point realized where his commander is walking. Um, I know that he's basically gone straight up where that white circle is. I know that he's walked from his base to that. And so I'm trying to think, well, where is he most likely to go? He knows where my commander is. So I'm assuming that he's going to walk towards the grunts, which he ends up doing. So at this point, I'm trying to focus more on that far side of the map, which is why I'm continuing to raid over in the corner and yeah. trying to find places over there that make sense. Right. So that he's, I it will at least have the ability to circumvent the middle of the map like you were talking about. I feel like I have to either take both edges, so I'm going to start walking my commander mm. towards the corner right. and basically try to just give up the middle in pursuit of taking the edges. Uh, uh, so, I, you know, that's that's a decent thought process. Oh, one, if I could comment on that, I'd say, in, in a way, you have to... You might kind of be feeding into this play style. Like, say he has, like, this part of the map, like his main base and mid, and you're trying to run, like, all the way around that to to get harassment done right cool makes sense but to say you start like leaving like rec fields on his side of the map suddenly like a reclaim field starts forming here and then it's like oh no well now i have to like i have this huge distance between that and i'm even like be, like i guess he has like a shorter way to kind of walk and like cut that off or even reinforce that position with units out of his factory right does that make sense yeah, um, so in general, I'm just, you'll see it happen in this game, actually. I get that, and I just attack on my side. So the same thing happens. We end up getting a giant reclaim field a little bit north of my commander currently. Yeah. And I just push that advantage because I have that edge of the map. Right. But at this point in the game, it's more just let me secure that top side and yeah. at least keep an eye on it. And then I'll more or less ignore it for the rest of the game I see. once I can kind of lock down that edge. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, you really want to be... Like if you are pushing, you want to be able to way you want to have a way to like contest the reclaim field or perhaps like take a position on the map and secure it. Um, if I was looking at this, I can pause it here. I would be feeling I'd be feeling okay from this position, even though he's got mid and he's kind of got it locked up with like LLTs and stuff like that. There's still like you said, like you can still expand to to this north side here and finish locking that locking that down. But also having the ability to like deny bottom left for him. Like if you have top right denying bottom left, right? Or even like pushing through bottom left. Um seems pretty good, right? Um, even even this is fine. Like if I saw all this, I would even like queue up like one one lasher, one wolverine, and just try and get it like parked back here and just kinda just leave that. I mean, you just force him to deal with it, right? So Pounders are insane too. Um, this means it's crazy. 
Interesting how you went to like right into medium tanks. I think if he was still on like a grunt composition, I would maybe make more incisors for a bit till you were kind of convinced he's made the switch to vehicles, you know? I I think I did four one uh, medium tanks to pounders, and I felt like I just wanted to skip incisors because I had a full metal bar. Right, right. And I figured I could at least dump because that'll let me deal with the LLTs and the exploiters significantly better. Right. I can just send a couple of tanks to clear those, and then pounders yeah. with the grunts more or less counters his grunts. Yeah, but you, like if we're looking to like kind of pressure, I suppose uh, the pounders. Like early pounders are great. I might like I even like make two straight away off of a vehicle transition, but I'll at least maybe make like twenty in size or something like that. Because if you have grunts still on the board, right? And size or grunt have are like pretty kind of I guess like flexible or like they have about the same movement speed, right? What is it? Eighty one movement speed. Is there an incisor somewhere? <laughs> I don't think I made it. Uh, okay. Um eighty six, right? So compared to the, like the medium tank 73. So if you're still looking to like kind of raid and pressure and find holes, like the, uh, the, the grunt incisor in that mid game can, um, like you can leverage that tech before you finally make the transition to straight medium tanks. Cause I, I will notice like you, you had, you did spend all of your energy, your metal pretty quickly making those medium tanks. So, um, it's not like you're. Yeah, you want to spend your metal as quickly as possible, but now it even kind of looks like we're kind of stalling at the moment. So, um, I think there was a small AFK in this game. My client yeah. was bugged out, yeah. So yes. there was a good 10, 20 seconds where just nothing was happening, and then I came back. Right. This is great. I love medium tanks at this phase in the game because, like, all that time and uh, energy your opponent spent making like LLTs are kind of like for naught because they're so they're so tanky, right? Uh, that was nice. You got his uh. uh uh, geo there that was actually kind of crazy you got that like 300 energy per second i will add if you put a geo up on this map it's like they're like better energy storage but in the case like i think what is it one one geothermal actually supports for for energy converters so maybe in that exact case on this map like if you make the uh geothermal you can make like four four energy converters with your commander something like that to to offset that this is a huge commitment to llts okay all right not bad this huge gap here uh from our opponent kind of letting those tanks in and these pounders kind of locking it down here in mid really strong right so i'd like to see that pushing into pounders is not not really good Let's look at the main base here. I wish I could kind of look at, follow your player camera, but we just have to look at your player view. It's not that bad. You can totally watch the player camera. Yeah. It's just a little skewed. It's fun. Yeah. Okay, sorry if that's fast for you guys. I could maybe even slow that down, but I'm noticing you're not really macroing a lot and or like even like in this case, yeah, you are fairly zoomed out. I would like to see you playing a lot more like this if you're gonna be microing. Instead of kind of zoomed in. Well this is this is fairly good. Yeah, like Well one thing I'm noticing is like um oh shit, alright, uh, maybe losing a commander <laughs> to four LOTs and <laughs> uh twin guards um you know you might actually get away with like a cloak here and walking up but that's kind of ballsy anyways um what i was gonna say is like we have metal in the bank we've got decent e like i still don't see an energy storage like i would be making that every game energy storage and then of course here i'd be thinking um all right maybe like one more construction turret and um at least four cons at scaling e like we're like well into the mid game right now so you can you could tolerate having like an additional contract right here and then like four four wind farms like going up something like that and then if you're still like if you go up to like multiple energy storage then you finally you could start adding on energy converters right but i think um i think mainly i would just focus on 
it's trying to spend the metal get the getting these raids looks nice right trying to force a force like a constant fight and get res bots on top of it which kind of seems like what we're doing see your commander's doing over here walking over here reclaiming and clearing out all these llts in mid pretty efficiently so it's kind of opening the door for your units in mid Yeah, it it looks like I'm building exactly what you were talking about with my base. Every, I seem to be just a few seconds late with all of the comments. Mm -hmm. it's funny. Mm -hmm. the, I wish the Geos were more easier to secure on this map. And um, I guess having mid kind of denies your denies you from taking this one, from this one. He got this Geo up, which was huge. Like, he should not have let that guy snipe. Like, that was, that was a huge blunder on his part, actually. It's like 300 energy per second. Is this on 2x? Sorry about that. Okay, all right. I think uh, I think this game's about over, right? Like he's feeding. A, yeah. Yeah, it's a giant snowball from here, basically. Right. I more or less get control of the middle and continue to pound the middle. Yeah, and right, then right, right. slowly march that advantage down. The right. That's yeah. That's exactly what I'm seeing. Oh, these two twin guards are the hill are nice, but. Like you did a, you had a great trade right there. Maybe like like pushing into these pounders a little too far, but of course you've like there's this huge three k reclaim field here. Your commander's already on top of it. His commander's over here, like assisting this completely useless dragon small. Um, and that's this is um. I don't want to say this is how like one v ones go all, all the time, but you have to be like really cognizant of. If you are taking a fight, where is it going to be like 30 seconds, two minutes down the road? And what is that reek like? What is the reclaim position going to look like? Right. So say, yeah, this is a, this is exactly what I wanted to point out. You have a contested reclaim field and like this is a res bot on res, right? If you're ever on top of a contested reclaim field, you need to be reclaiming like 100%, especially if you're stalling metal, right? So yeah, the build power is great and, st and energy. So Rezzing takes a lot of energy, and uh, it's kind of like a no-brainer to have these uh, to reclaiming. Unfortunately for him, uh, there's five pounders there to kind of shoot, shoot those res bots off the field. And yeah, Napoleon has a full energy, full metal bar right now. So even though the reclaim is contested, like, I mean, maybe you could make the argument. Okay, go T2, I guess. Um put up a metal storage. Right? I wouldn't have gone T2 so early. Yeah, sorry. Um, that T2 transition gives him the opportunity to build units and shove um, shove you off the wreck field. In fact, if he hadn't been feeding his units in one by one, right. he would have a large enough army that he could force you off right about now. And then you'd be T2 with reduced metal income. And that's not going to get units out fast enough for to like keep him from rolling over you yeah that's a great point um because like i'm looking at this army right here in mid and there there's no reinforcements on the way there's like some units kind of out of position over here but if gecko is a little bit more diligent about like understanding his commander needs to be over here earlier and had kept up with the production like um i think i think yeah the, that exact scenario right like he like gecko pushes you off of this reclaim field and suddenly you have like yeah t2 and I guess a decent metal income, like you have metal in the bank too, but um, that's actually that's a, that's a pretty fair point. I think it was a knee jerk reaction to holy cow, there's four thousand metal, and I'm already up on metal. Let me right. just build something expensive, right, right, uh, and switch to reviving instead. But that's a fair. Point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking out loud here, but I mean before. I, I like having like the one, 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 right? Like one vehicle lab, mm -hmm. one bot lab, one air lab, right? In this, before you make the T2 transition, because like, especially if you say you had gone air lab in, instead of a, uh, instead of T2, um, mm -hmm. of course it gives you access to the transport, but you can make scouts, see where he is at. You can make sure he's, of course, um, you can like the transports are kind of insane, like transporting contours to the front line to like repair your units and, reclaim stuff is pretty good your math on where when to build something expensive shouldn't be about um 
shouldn't be about how much you have in storage. That should determine how many, how much like build power you put down. How, the math on how you like when you put down something expensive depends on how long it's going to take you to like, like how much time do you have before you need that at the front line. Right now, because you've only got a small army, it's not going to take him long at all to shut down that army, make it essentially useless, so I can't like go and attack, it's sitting there idling essentially. Um, what you want is you want, before you go something like T2, ideally, um, either, like, unless you're like cheesing T2 out, what you probably want to do is a more, um, get enough of an army advantage that you can continue attacking him and outnumbering his army while you build that T2 factory. So you're much more of a fan of even something like a feint where once your tier 2 is up and producing, go ahead and just send in the rest of the tier 1 to put as much pressure as possible to let I, the T2 I, replace in general. Mm, no, no. I wouldn't say that. I It's... It's not about send in your T2, T1 two and get rid of them. It would be better for you to reclaim your T1 units than to send them in just to get rid of them. Yeah. What, what it is, if you have a critical mass of T1 units, like if you don't have more than a critical amount of T1 units, you can't continue attacking him, which makes it very trivial for him to just build up his army and then take you out. And then... By the time your T2 units come to the front, there alone, you've got no T1 army left. He's pushed you off the wreck field, so he can go T2, and he's got yeah. this snowballed army that you don't know how to deal with because you have basically no army. Right. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Right. And um, that ties back into the whole if like, you tempo can... side of things we were talking about earlier, right? It's like going yeah. transitioning, like you let go of any kind of tempo you have, um, like unless of course you have a huge T1 army still, right? So, yeah, I've had a number of different scenarios where sometimes I can basically the better players that I see or that I play against typically don't have gaps in their tempo. Uh, it's a fairly and, so that's yeah. going exactly what you're talking about. So I didn't realize yeah. that. The timing, uh, yeah, it's it's a great tip. It's a good way to think about it. Yeah, I only learned that recently watching Zhao because I I really struggle with that transition too. Dude, Zhao is so good. Like I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think he's that like number scary. one on the leaderboard right now, isn't he? On like AP8s, but sorry, I'm just I trying to AP8 game with Zhao the other day. It was scary. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty good. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to grab some screenshots for uh for later um we we talked about a lot of things i i'd say uh maybe the biggest takeaway was just the point master bell was taking i, I think uh like yielding tempo to and this position to make a t trans t2 transition is is a bit of a blunder like uh i think yeah because say here's the push you off the rack field Right. Yeah, it absolutely happens exactly as you were describing. Right, right, right. So yeah, it, it, yeah. It was, it, you nailed it perfectly. I just didn't realize it until you brought it up. Right, which also yeah. ties back into the point, like if you're on a contested reclaim field, to be reclaiming it. Don't ever res a contested because it's it can happen so quickly. It's like so That was yeah. why I swapped to resing because I realized, oh, crap, I don't have any units up here. Yeah. I need some units. Thankfully, I still had five pounders. So as I ran for my life, they were able to slow things down enough that I didn't take a whole ton of damage, and I another, ended up equalizing, but it was scary for a minute, yeah. yeah. Another interesting thing to note is that he didn't attack you until you attacked him. If you're in a weak position, don't let them know by failing to attack them. If you fail to attack him, he'll turn around and run you down. Yeah, that's a good point. True, true, true. And it can, I, I'd add to that is, like, if you are doing a T2 transition, like you don't want to squander your T what's left of your T1 army by like kind of attacking you, you in a way, like you might want to like feign aggression, but really you're like in a weak spot until you can get the T2, T2 units out and like on the board getting value. So um, like throw like blundering or throwing away a T2 army or T1 army while you're making a T2 transition is, uh, is, is really bad. Um, 
basically as a rule of thumb like t1 units hitting t2 tanks is like a no-no like you you just never want that to happen so like i'm looking at this micro right here and i'm seeing like yeah getting hit by the dragon small or even like kind of walking in front of these tanks like i know it doesn't seem like a big deal but it's like that's how t1 players can stay in the game longer by like still getting value out of their units because like they don't they these tanks completely it's like it's like a grunt versus a, a pawn right it's like you can you can micro them infinitely right yeah. the infinite value so um Your attacks are also really spread out. Like you're fighting a dragon more over there, and you're fighting like raiders over there. If you focus on all your things attacking one one object at the same time, that maximizes oh, that that like r kills his unit faster, so it can't fire for as long. But then also as few as possible of his units are firing at you at any one time, right. and so um, you kill his units faster. And you take far less damage overall. Or tigers are the goal. That's gonna be GG, I guess. Yeah, this commander's. I think it goes on. For, he survived that somehow. It's but it's more oh. of the same. I end up just continuing to make vehicles and driving down that exact lane, and eventually I win. Yeah. It right, there's right. not much left. Well, well, that exact driving down that lane. It's like you see this overextension of this last army. That army could have been much better served sitting on the wreck field in the middle and defending it. Now now that he's got um yeah, now that you I drove into his space him, and lost frankly. those units. I um, went to go kill him. So I agree with yeah, you in yeah. general that I do that, but yeah. I, I thought I could kill him. I got like one percent, so had to give a yeah. shot. He was literally yeah. one son. Well that honestly that's why as a rule I don't go for those commander dives because it's it's taking a huge advantage that you have and turning it into into a coin flip essentially but it's and so, so exciting you could kill the dude i can't <laughs> help it <laughs> he was there i had guys no that's a that's a good point a good point and i think it shows like just the two different play styles right there's very much the players who would look at that and just be like oh go for the comp snipe right and then i think i'm a little more in master bell's vein where i'm just like well i have an advantage i can just grind out a victory by not making mistakes right mm -hmm. so that's kind of um yeah it's like you go up to a commander and you give him you like activate the most powerful weapon in the game right it's it's <laughs> not like you're you're giving him a gift in a sense i agree with you on paper and in the moment i couldn't help i that's all I can say, but you're totally right on paper. Totally I'm trying to correct. help you help yourself. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, hey, Sargeras, nice to see you. I have a question I've been meaning to ask for a long time. I don't know if anyone can hear me. Yeah, um, earlier yeah, yeah. it was mentioned, I really struggle with the, the T2 transition immensely. Um, and I kind of, that's always kind of why I've thought of, is kind of feigning aggression, you know, not, not showing weakness, so you're kind of hiding that transition, but, like, I guess, like, how would one do that, um, you know, when you have a significantly smaller, you know, weakened army and you're trying to hold a position, how do you, um, how do you effectively bluff? Dragon uh, Claws, oh. Conturrets, Janices. <laughs> Janices. <laughs> Blo block blocking their information is the best way to bluff. Um, if they can see that you're weak, they're so much more likely to just attack you. Um, so try to hide your army. Don't let him know how much army you have. Um, if you can... Like, actually make that army that you've got left an actual tangible threat. And otherwise, like, um, just seed ground. Don't lose your army because that's just wreckages yeah, for him to yeah. reclaim. Seed ground, allow him to take ground. Yes, you lose, like, 10, 20 mechs, maybe. But that can be enough time for you to get enough army. And then, because you've obviously made a mistake to get to a point where he's got an advantage in a sense past a certain point you're just waiting for him to make a mistake and let you get back in the game and 
we're all bad at the game. We're all going to make mistakes. And so that opportunity might not come, but in a sense, you're waiting for that to come. Was this question based on AVA or 1v1? Goes for either, to be honest. I feel it's different. Yeah. I was, I was mainly thinking of 1v1, although I'm more, more used to 8v8s, although I'm thinking of kind of ditching that and going for more 1v1s to kind of get more, I guess, mastery and stuff. Yeah. Because in 8v8, there's so much more, you know, the, the team dynamics and stuff, and, you know, teach you transition isn't as simple as, you know, oh, well... Uh, you know, checks watch, I guess it's, you know, it's convenient for me and it would, you know, it would be strategically viable right now, so yeah. I'll just do it, you know, you, well, no, that, uh, you that, have the tech position. That's a good point. It's, I think, I think making T2 transition and 1v1s is a lot more about understanding the game state and tempo and it's like what you can get away with without like losing the game straight up because like, I mean, that's, I mean, yeah. It's exactly the same in 8v8, although you have to account for, like, the game position of your allies as well. But you're you're still thinking about tempo in the 8v8 scenario. Yeah. I think yeah. mines are a really good way to speaking, hide. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, very generally speaking, like, in 1v1s, if you imagine your opponent has, like, 20 to 25 extra medium tanks on you from, like, this position when you're considering teching does that kill you, right? Like, that's kind of the question that you ultimately have to ask yourself, because that's the position you're putting yourself in when you decide to make a, t a Tier 2 lab, right? Yeah. You're trading one advantage for a different advantage. Yeah, I agree with that. It almost feels like tucking the Tier 2 and 1v1 is almost like a cheese, because if you do it and he pushes, you lose instantly. You can lose, but like mm -hmm. what Sargeras was going to add there, is like, mines are a great way to facilitate that transition and like i don't know if you guys are using mines but it, they're kind of insane like so just throwing that out there put a couple of mines yeah. in between a reclaim field if it does push you off like half the units are gonna die on the mines right i do yeah, use them uh, fairly regularly i heard there was a change to mines where they sort of auto reveal and i haven't noticed any different what is the actual change it's with the mine layers yeah. The mine layers will now auto reveal mines near them and automatically use their attack. Ah, to them, I think. okay. They'll automatically in attack them? Command. in fight command. In fight command, I okay. believe. Okay, okay. Yeah. There was some bug with it, I guess. Uh, I guess one of the normal like like A move or F move or something didn't work the way it should, but right. yeah, they should be able to automatically clear now. Okay, okay. So uh, Back to regarding the T2 transition question and whether or not it's a cheese, it doesn't always have to be. One of the biggest situations where going for T2 isn't a cheese is when the enemy, like Gecko, has put down a lot of defenses because they're units that can't come and attack you. If they've put down like 4,000, 5,000 metal worth of defenses, which isn't unprecedented in a 1v1 game, that can lead to a situation where both of you have a sizable army, but it's not worth attacking the other person because you'd be attacking into their mobile army, the same size as yours, plus defenses. And so it can make attacking infeasible, but or less feasible than ecoing or tagging. Or an air switch or any alternative that allows you to gain an advantage without having to deal with their static defenses mm. um it, they do have to build a lot of static defenses for that to be worth it but in a situation like gecko's it it's quite possible that he's invested that sheer amount of value into his defenses yeah he gets 28 exploiters at 250 metal apiece so um <clears throat> I mean, and, and that yeah. kind of plays into the strength of like the naked expanding style because like you can have more units that can move around. Suddenly, if you had all these like nexus capped like this and you have 20 medium tanks here, 20 medium tanks here, 20 medium tanks here, just kind of exaggerating the position, right? But then you can just make a T2 lab no sweat. He can never push in and like, are you transitioning right now? Like that can, like you're denying information. Like he can't attack you because he has metal and static defenses right and uh, you just kind of get away with it so 
So what you're saying is the best time to transition to T2 is like when, like, you know, whether they know, know it or not, they're, they're not able to, there's, you know, they're just not in a position where they can roll you. Yeah. Um, um, that can, you know, uh, no matter what they know. That's, that's kind of tough. Cause in, in some ways, like r- taking risks gets you advantages right so maybe you snuck in a t2 transition or it was a little bit of a risk perhaps and like now you can leverage better economy units like more efficient energy production structures so like yeah you don't want that's it's tough Uh, maybe in like that like below 40 os yeah be in a stable position split the map in half have an air lab up scout your opponent right um mm-hmm. and then do a teacher and transition you know something like that. it really comes down to trading advantages it's like a risk is like capitalizing on an information advantage often it's like you know they're not going t2 and they don't know they can attack you and so you can use the fact that they don't know that they can attack you to consider yourself invulnerable and better players are more likely to know that they can attack you and so you've got to weigh what advantages you have and capitalize on them and know that while you're doing if the enemy knows what advantages they have they will capitalize on that so i'm curious out of your 1v1 games out of 10 games how often are you getting to tier 2 like um i don't play a lot of 1v1 recently but it really depends on how the opponent plays uh, on on greenhaven maybe. and how how even the game is because uh, on Greenhaven, I wouldn't play many T2 games on this, but maps like Hades Pond, Canis River, um, Vista Hades, uh, any kind of like little, slightly larger map, I would say 75% of the games are, are going T2, you know? But, Damn. Yeah. I would say I've played up the ladder a bit. Once you get, I would say, north of about 35, you're going to see T2 transitions in more games than not. Right. And then how high you get is very map dependent, yeah. but that's roughly where I'd say it starts. You're One not more stuck quick T2. Question. Go ahead. About um transitioning. Like if we look at Napoleon's base, there's like seven con turrets, I think. Yeah, there's seven. Um would it be an option like when you're reclaiming and wanting to transition to assign a few of the turrets to your tier one production so you keep producing tier one units? So you can reinforce your front while also dumping metal into building the tier two. Um, hmm. I feel like that would just be less metal going toward like the advantage that you have by having a tech two lab up and running, right? Yeah, you don't want to half ass anything. You always want to full ass anything you do. Right, which is like yeah. upgrading mexes and or making a fusion. So, um hot take i guess if you're stalling energy after you have a t2 con out make a fusion at the cost of stopping all your production don't upgrade t2 maxes like make a t2 fusion and then start restart your production right because you're just kind of like the the um these actually draw quite a bit of energy the uh the t2 maxes but like yeah, and, and, and that even goes up to like reclaiming your lab right like reclaim your t2 lab to make a fusion and like that'll like so, uh, imagine this right say say he was stalling for metal and energy he gets a he wants to get a fusion up right what is that four thousand five hundred metal the lab is twenty nine hundred twenty nine hundred right and even along the way like as soon as that uh fusion is up you can reclaim 10 solars 10 solars right which is another 1500 metal so um another that said like keep in mind like if you're going to build like a T2 lab and a fusion and T2 maxes, that's like 8,000 of metal right. that you're dedicated to some something that it takes the enemy, like, but it takes that an amount of time for that to pay off. And right. so you need to know you've got that time for it to all pay off. Right. There is a small side effect too. Uh, Conjurers do pretty good prioritizing what they should be doing. There are a few situations where they're not ideal. I've lost games, though, by assigning a con turret to a lab and forgetting that I've done that, and then have it not assist anything. So you are incurring right. a slight APM when you set them to do a specific thing, because you need to clear that at some point, too. So, yeah. 
yeah. that would just be a G clear. Yeah, sure. Whatever key binding you or have for stop should set them back to whatever they do by default. Okay. Uh, or fight command, Perfect. I suppose. Just selecting everything and fight commanding. Just a small mm. note. You do have to do it if you set them. So I'm not a fan of doing that, yeah. is, except for very specific situations, typically in the very early part of the game, when you're just trying to get a specific build order done, and that's it. Otherwise, I leave them alone. Right, right. Or yeah, like... that's. Yeah. Um, I, I have I definitely have issues with forgetting that I set the build turrets later. I hardly ever do that. And um and like when Napoleon was saying, it's like if you set it and forget it, then it's like <laughs> it can be to your own detriment. Whereas like the contour, it's pretty smart and it's like it'll just like it, it's it's free APM, right? It's juggling back and forth between what it wants to assist. So like that is a, that's efficient enough for me to to just kinda you know, have it going. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering I'm if a, we should finish watching the rest of the game. Sorry, Sagaris, was that are you chiming in? Yeah, you already said most of what I was going to say with talking about, you know, eating the lab for a fusion potentially. But, like, you can also easily go back to T1 and just absolutely spam medium tanks as you're upgrading your mexes and stuff because they're much cheaper than trying to spam out tigers or something. Right. But you can eat your lab and fund a bunch of tanks, you know, especially if you get halfway through your lab and realize you're not as safe as you thought you were. Um, just pump out one con, eat it, right? go back to T1. Right. You can even almost plan for that, right? Like tech into bots so that you have like your T2 con plus twitchers and everything and then reclaim your lab, make your fusion, yeah. and then when you're ready for tier 2 unit production, make a tank lab for tigers. Like right. you can almost yeah. have that build planned out. Yeah. Or like as vehicles, you can go one czar and then eat the lab and go into medium tanks, and that czar will be like a huge <laughs> force multiplier. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. that czar will just kill everything, and the medium tanks will just beat a meat shield of the czar, I suppose. It's funny you mentioned czars. Yeah, I, I know. You, agree yeah, you just made one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I noticed that you made one. <laughs> I, I like I like that point. Was that you, Nutty Wombat, about just like the con twitcher and then... Like, cause like well, how I, most of the time when I like to do yeah. like one v one like uh, transitions and one v one to T two, I won't do it unless I can make like one con two twitchers, and I'm like the twitchers are basically to start laying mines everywhere, like so. And if I do a T two bot transition, most of the time it's off of the medium tank part of the game, right? Like I have medium tanks on the board and I go T two bots, right? So it's just kind of like how I'm comfortable doing things, right? To answer your suspicion, though, by the way, you've been more than generous with your time on this replay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Feel free to, yeah, move on. Thank you. Oh, Appreciate it, everybody. Oh, so uh, gonna, much of good advice. Oh, I was going to ask real quickly, and I <clears throat> just one last thing about this, why um, kind of uh, Blue Gecko's thought process into kind of this, you know, setting up this base that we see here over on the right, um, you know, what's, I guess, what was, what do you guys think was the, the idea behind that? Um, you're talking about like all the LLTs in the middle? Yeah. Um, and like the, um, uh, Blue Gecko was just kind of hanging out there. Well, the commander having their commander just sort of hang out over there for a long time, you know, while they were actively losing the, uh, or starting to lose the the salvage field. Mm -hmm. Master Bell, go ahead. I think I saw you chiming in or lighting up there. Mm -hmm. Do you like to answer that? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Were you asking if I wanted to answer that? Yes. Yes. I I don't know what his mentality was. If I was in that position and using that, I would have. I um, I'd have used the advantage of like the laser towers in the mid to drop a second factory because like having a second factory closer to the front uh, does point. wonders for your like map control oh, yeah. instant units on the front line yeah yeah be. um <laughs> like so imagine yeah, we can't, yeah. We can't. 
Go ahead, Nutty. Sorry, I was just gonna say, we also kind of touched on it toward the beginning when we were talking about, like, the layout of the map, where, like, where the high-value areas that you want to try to contest and control are, and mid has, like, the tightest cluster of a lot of mexes there, so I think that was one reason why Gecko was, like, digging in in that area. It was just because there's a ton of metal there, plus all the geos. I think he was trying to rebuild that one geo, like, five times throughout the course of that game. Right, right. Um... Mid, mid is very powerful to control and having that forward bot lab is just like it makes thugs specifically like a forward bot lab with thugs is kind of insane like like it synergizes with the commander really well like you can get res bots to the front really quickly and of course you're cutting off the movement like the reinforcement time bringing those slow moving thugs to the front so it's kind of like um really strong play i see a lot of players do that um <clears throat> Uh, we didn't have any, well, sorry, we had another 1v1 ticket submitted, but Neb's not here, so I don't really necessarily want to go over it without him. Just a reminder, if you guys do want to have, like, review, I'm doing these every week, so feel free to submit a ticket of, like, a 1v1 game, and it'll just be, like, that's what we'll do next week. So between now and then, um, put it, if you want a ticket re reviewed, put it in the Bar Academy, tag at Mentor, and then, um... I can write a write you a message in, in there. Chip, are you, you have a question or Chip Rockets? Oh no, sorry, I was just here to to watch the the uh, the session. Okay, cool. Sorry, I saw your mic going off, so I didn't know if you're. Sorry, I'll uh, mute it. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll set the stage for this game. This is uh, X Factor Live versus Teddy from the bar pro league season four or uh semi-finals right so i'm not sure if you guys caught that it was last weekend x Factor live absolutely incredible player same for teddy these guys are like easily like top three top five players in the game right so the map is tundra and i wanted to look at teddy's open because he despite he i think he kind of didn't quite win the early game um but I've seen I've seen him use the same heavy scout style on multiple maps versus multiple opponents. So I wanted to kind of touch like highlight this uh, this vehicle open style and and um, maybe even after the fact we can look at X Factor's open because I think he does the classic his namesake build like the X Factor build right, which um, we can touch on that in a moment. But for now, kind of want to study this little bit of a vehicle open. This is like one of the things I've done. Uh, I think the least of like I'm more of a I've been more of a bot player, but um, it's just nice to study study these guys. So this is Tundra, 14 wind speed map. We can see like he's doing this three mechs open, which you do a little bit of a walk. This is super technical. If you do a small walk with a three mechs open, you really don't end up stalling before the third mechs finishes, so you don't have to like worry about that. You can just go three mechs immediately into two solars, which is nice. So that's what we see here. Um, I'd imagine Teddy would have wanted to go like four or five wind turbines before his vehicle lab, but it's just a function of the wind speed at the start of the game. Like you have no energy. Ha Sir, go ahead. Has anybody counted the number of steps? Because I've noticed the same thing, that, but I've never actually counted the commander steps required to not right. stall. That'd be a fun little number to know. Right. Um, it's a little bit, it's a bit, I think <laughs> like you do a bit of a walk, you can get away with it, right? Because like, I'm sure some of you may know like you don't stall a lot doing the three max open, but you certainly have stalled a little bit. So um, there are ways to, I don't want to, I don't want to get on like, to, there are ways to avoid doing that. Basically you just start a solar for a bit, let your energy accumulate. I don't know if you all know, but solars don't take energy and don't take any energy to produce. So if you're stalling energy, it's great to make these solars with your commander because you, you're using all of that build power and fixing your E issues, right? So it's just, Kind of a really strong thing to have in your back pocket right um of course this is a pretty this is a standard of a standard open gets like three max two solars in the vehicle lab and uh, let's take a look at this build queue three scouts one con 100 scouts right and you might ask yourself why 100 scouts well i think teddy is just going to continue making these until he until he feels comfortable enough to make the second con and expand so let's take a look and see maybe we can glean when does Teddy feel comfortable enough to make the second con and like what is he actually doing with his scouts? So I'm gonna just 
I don't know if I'll do the player claim exactly. It gets kind of hectic, but let's just unpause and kind of see what he does with these scouts, how long he assists the factory, so on and so forth. These are the kind of things I'm looking for when I'm studying a build of like a, a really strong player. I want, I really am interested to see how this vehicle opening works because I've only tried opening vehicles a couple of times and every single time it has gone absolutely disastrous. Right, and I'm thinking um, like um, <laughs> protecting yourself against ticks and other enemy scouts, right, can be uh, a lot more difficult. That's why personally I like opening bots. I think it's a little more stable and easier to micro against these like harassing units. But um of course in bar, like I think it's best to be able to to be to be able to do all these things and have a wider range, especially in 1v1s. But I mean in the case of like 8v8s, like um kind of want to understand how these things work. Of course. Uh, I see Teddy is like bouncing between making these wind turbines and assisting the lab. So like, like as a rule of as a rule of thumb, I think if you're over half of an energy bar at this early point in the game, you kind of want to be assisting the lab. And we see him like, kind of tagging the lab, assisting, coming back, making another um, making another wind turbine. And I'll touch on maybe uh, was that. What, sporadic? Was that you talking about vehicle opens? Yeah, that oh, was oh. that was me, and I was kind of, yeah, I was, yeah. Okay, okay, so um, just in general, if you do a 3-max vehicle open, I would at least make two scouts first uh, out of the factory and then go into the con, right, and immediately send them across the map. That's going to let you see this exact thing right here, a scout moving across the map to you. So... There's a big thing like it, three mechs opens are inherently slightly like more vulnerable and risky compared to like the most aggressive thing your opponent can do, which is like a one mech tick open. So that's just kind of the impetus behind it. If you do a three max vehicle open, just make two scouts and send them across the map. So that out of the way, we see this other scout is just kind of like patrolling literally in the back of the base and kind of notice like the commander's protecting this, maybe in a, and the con is attack uh, protecting the back side of like the weak side of the base. So just a little thing uh, I'm looking at and noticing. Um, we're still we're over half of an energy bar, so Teddy can just like immediately just sit on this and put all his build power and metal into assisting this first con out, which lo and behold is going to kind of pretty much naked expand. Right, he's going to put a mech down, put down this beautiful forward radar, and then he's going to go. Max, max, LLT, max, max, LLT, right? And even notice like the positioning on these LLTs, right? Like protects these maxes. This LLT like goes all the way up to the ledge right here. So units really can't get past. Like they, units can't get through the middle. So I'm looking and I'm seeing there's just this barely like this little tiny gap that units can kind of slip through in here. So pretty good positioning, right? I I missed what was the purpose of the little scout in... Um that Teddy has just running, that was running back and forth mm. uh, next to the mechs. Yeah, that's kind of just protecting what the commander can't hit. So if we look at the position of the commander right underneath the factory right here, and you look at the attack radius on him, it's kind of protecting his wind turbines and his solar. Uh, and if you look like, well, the only thing that's really truly vulnerable is this mechs back here. So that scout is just patrolling back uh, the back side of that mechs to kind of protect it for now while these two other scouts are on the other side of the map protecting it. So one thing I wanted to touch on was like this, this style is a bit different than what you normally see from vehicle players as Teddy just continues to make scouts, right? It's like this really heavy scout style. He's just going to keep on making these and like trying to harass and send them across the map. Um, X factor did a great job. I don't think he, I think he actually predicted like saw Teddy's previous game, so he knew to make extra scouts himself. So a bit of meta gaming going on here, but in general, I think Teddy's open here is very, very stable um, against maybe someone you think is kind of playing vehicles as well. Um, think against if, if he had if he if those with those initial scouts say if Teddy had spotted a grunt moving across the map. You very well may have seen him queue up, queue up a single incisor or something like that. But you know, scout versus scout, perfectly stable. Like 
even now we see Teddy's got a bit of a scout advantage, right? We see um, three, you can see three scouts, right? And he's got like several on the board, right? Like 10 scouts right here. So I'm just going to keep watching this view. He all is, literally all he's doing is like just assisting the lab with his commander, not adding on wins, just making scouts. Um, and then finally we see this con come out and it's like, it kind of makes sense, right? He still has 250 metal in the bank. He pretty much has a full energy bar. Um, cons, construction vehicles are very energy expensive, especially if you're trying to assist it with your commander, right? It's like minus 150 energy per second. And it's minus 50 energy per second to create the con. So about 200 energy per second. Which you see is very quickly spending his energy bar. And like as soon as this, this comes out, you might see Teddy out on like maybe one or two more wind turbines. But, you know, he doesn't really need to. Because he can just make scouts, right? So there's a bit of harassment and stuff going on. I, I try not to focus too much on this, but like, look, scouts going left, scouts going right. We have the scout over here, like catching this lane. This scout is moving down that lane, right? So like, this is just going to be brilliant um, map coverage, right? I mean, Teddy knows, right? There's no attack coming in this lane. There's no attack coming in this lane, right? It's kind of free to. Uh, harass and he can feel confident in expanding with these two cons right which like this is maybe what you what what some of you may struggle with trying to open vehicles right like defending yourself against those early harassing units right we're only three minutes and 20 seconds into the game but this is something you this is a, an open you can carry with you into a lot of different 1v1 maps right two cons expanding a forward radar right good map presence and coverage a single tank is finally out. It's actually moving across the map, but you can be like, feel free to kind of maybe move one tank this this lane here if you feel threatened, right? This tank could reinforce this position over here if you were feeling threatened and maybe like saw a grunt or a tank moving up this lane or that lane, right? So it's all of the name of the game is just like getting vision, getting radar, and protecting your expanding cons. That's kind of what you're looking to do at the start this point in the game. Still not moving into incisor production. We're just continuing to make stouts. I, I thought this was fascinating, really, like compared to what we see from a lot of vehicle players. And especially because I have to go here pretty shortly. Um, uh, who in the end wins this? Um, I'm curious. Yeah, X Factor. X Factor wins this game. Pretty sure. Oh, that's very, that's very interesting uh, to me, um, considering I how... I think X-Factor wins, I think X-Factor wins the series, but I believe okay. Teddy actually wins this game. Okay, okay, correctly. okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I, I, maybe I'd say, like, X-Factor won the early game part of this, or maybe I'm not saying that exactly right. What Teddy was looking to do was like get get an advantage or like leverage these scouts in some way against his build and X Factor kind of deflected it. So it's like as much as like I just thought this was a brilliant early game, really. Um and I think I think now that we've kind of covered Teddy's open, let's take a look at X Factor's open actually, because he has a much different take on vehicle opens and uh it works on just as many maps, right? And uh so let me quit this replay and restart it. Hopefully OBS handles this correctly. Sorry about that. I brought a lot of replays actually um, to look at. I have um, Chisato versus Sash Gorin on Hades Pond. I think I think he opened vehicles on that map. So excuse me. Let me um, let me uh, make sure OBS is picking this up. Sorry about the black screen, everyone. It. Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure my OBS picks up uh, picks up this game here. Um, there it is. There it is. Okay. <clears throat> so this should be the X Factor build, air quotes, um, which in my mind is to just get on nine mexes. Right? It's characterized by getting on nine mexes as quickly as you can. 
And there's a little walk with your commander, basically where if there's an adjacent three mechs you can pick up, you do a little bit of a walk with your commander to grab these two mechs. I think he ends up adding two LLTs here and here. And then you walk back to your factory and basically just make incisors on repeat. And I think you get like, I've seen him do different numbers of expanding cons, but really I think you can, you only really need one expanding con and we'll see him send that to the left of his main base. His commander expands right, grabs these mexes, walks back, and uh, you kind of just take the mid game from there. There's uh, some more technical things we can talk about perhaps like more like farther into the replay, but let's just kind of explore the, uh, the, the exact open together. So um this is this is a i think an adjustment he's made recently to this where he does a two max vehicle open which is a bit unorthodox i'd say most of the time i'd recommend players to do a three max vehicle open but specifically he's doing this to have a shorter walk distance to these adjacent mexes that's all he's trying to do as opposed to say spawning here with his commander and grabbing an easier one two three mexes right so and like maybe you put your lab right there and you have this much longer walk to come over here and expand to this. So he's adjusted his build. I think this is something I've seen him do recently, um, doing the two max, two max vehicle open or two max X factor build, if you will. Wind is lo going lower and sorry to keep pausing. So for those of you who know or don't know, Wind speed changes. Is it about, is it every 12 or 13 seconds? I'm not sure exactly when it is, but like if it is changing, it'll hold that, whether it's going up or down or staying constant, it'll hold that for about 13 seconds. And then there's just another um, random, I don't know, random number pops up and whether or not wind is going to go up, down, or stay the same. There is a little bit of like a different, like, <laughs> I don't want to get too far into it, but if it's like 13 seconds like this, right. And like your rate of change is like this, you would like, you would speed up, I think, and then slow down. I think that's how, I don't know. I'm bad at doing graphs. Sorry about this. Let's just continue with the build. One max winds going back up. So he kind of got baited into making the second solar. I'd imagine he would have wanted to go pure wind with this, but it is what it is. I'm actually really curious to know exactly how much energy per second he gets before he moves out of the base with his commander, because I think that's kind of important. Uh, you don't want to stall, or you don't want to excess a lot of energy. So basically, you only need the minimum you want. What is he going to do? One con into eight scouts. So this is a bit of an adjustment. Um, what's cool about this build is because you get your factory done so much quicker you don't have to make two scouts first, right? Unlike the three max vehicle lab open, you can do con first, which is a bit, excuse me, a bit of an advantage. Uh, first con comes out, we can see he's just going max radar, max, 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 right? So no LT is just completely naked expanding. And that's all just in this like vision of, I wanna have X amount of metal income and I'm gonna put it into making incisors and uh, I can go on and on about this, but let's just kind of get through this open. So let's see how many scouts does he assist before he moves out with his commander? One, two, three, four. Normally he stops at four, but of course, like we kind of pointed out earlier, he made some metagame decisions playing against Teddy. I'm, I'm, I would like to ask him actually, um, did, did he, how did he think he needed to adjust this build playing against Teddy? And I, I mean, from what I can notice and pick up on, he just stay, he's been making extra scouts. So yeah, one, two, three, four scouts. He moves out of the main base. Notice we have about, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> he has about a hundred energy per second energy income. So whether or not you had to make solars or wind turbines, really you want to like, you would want to do this making as few solars as possible but the end like the end result is having 100 energy per second and um moving out of the main base with your commander the max 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 llt radar llt right and then he's walking back to the lab teddy finding a max there so that's good okay i can kind of note that and uh, explain some things later, perhaps. 
But this is really like, and essentially this is the X factor build. If you've ever heard someone say that, this is exactly it. You're looking, you're trying to get on nine mexes as quickly as possible. And you do this little walk with your commander. So really, really excellent open. It just, it's so good against bot core bots. It's kind of hilarious. Um, I think that's why we saw fewer core bots played this season than other seasons, but I digress. Let me speed this. So what, is he up one mechs right now? He is. He actually would have been up another mechs. Um, oh, excuse me. Maybe he would have. This this Certainly this con would have been expanding quicker, right? Because he had to remake this single mechs right here. But in a second, yeah, he'll be up on this mechs here. So he's got two mechs going. Like, I mean, look how balanced this is, right? Just about to run out of metal. He's got this tank making... And just like tanks on repeat, that's what we're going to see. The radar goes up, commander's walking back. And I think he like got away with it, right? That's how I'd characterize that because you are kind of risking this is super vulnerable, right? There's literally nothing assisting the lab. There's there's no LOT, there's nothing, right? It's just scouts, he's bank, he's like trying to protect himself, protect himself with just two incisors and a couple of uh, scouts versus like mass scout, right? So... And yeah, he's got quite a bit of a metal income advantage. Yeah, and here we are. Now you just stay on incisor production. And um, I don't want to get too far into this. We've actually been, this is actually about an hour and a half, which is a little more than like a, what I wanted to do. Um, does anybody have any like questions or comments or some things they would want to maybe talk about next week or uh, anything like that? Armada gameplay. Armada gameplay. Okay. All Armada right. Armada gameplay. Yeah. No, no, no. That's a that's a good one actually. Um, I I haven't I've, I haven't done nearly as much um, practice studying of Armada as I as I would like to. So that's a, that's a good one. I'll keep an eye out for some games and maybe I can even pull from the uh, recent one V one tournament, maybe some, uh, some matchups where players went arm. I'm actually thinking of a few games <laughs> that had some cheeky arm play. So, uh, maybe, Did it work? uh, well, uh, maybe stay tuned, maybe show up next week and you tell me how about that? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, dark spirit. I see you hanging out here. Nice to see you, man um sure. hello yeah yeah uh excellent player to study for navy on supreme isthmus i'm not sure if you're still grinding that map or not but uh yeah definitely a definitely a strong player much less these days yes <clears throat> well i guess that means you have the chance to, to play 1v1s uh <laughs> Right, right. So I think we'll end it there. Um, just want to say, you know, thanks for showing up, guys. We should be doing more of these. I'm going to do another one next week. Same time, same place, right? Um, I promise I'll do a more EU-friendly time in the future. But just, you know, thanks for showing up. It's nice to have people here asking questions. And like Master Bell, same for you, like chiming in and giving your input and uh, you know intuition behind the game. So it helps, uh, you know, the more the merrier. So really, thanks, guys, for showing up. Yeah, that's it for me. Uh, if you can, like the video, comment, leave, uh, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in, in the next one. Thanks for watching.